they don't like those as well. They like the shore and eagerly waiting to do it soon. Uh, so I would say, so the expectation, as we discussed previously in my first attempt to make sure, the expectation of X, S hat. Okay, let's, let's, okay. So first of all, let's stick to this carefully. We know that expectation is linear. So this is equal to the sum of the expected value of the excess hat over all this. Okay, that's step one. That's good. Okay. That's just not nice. That's not nice to me. Yeah. But it's recording. The last class actually was not nice to me. And it is not a good Oh. Yeah, the last class was have a sim problem. So but the back of us. The what happened? The backup. So this camera has a backup. Yeah. So whenever we see the staff problem, there's a backup that of the sector. Huh? But the backup was deleted. Right. Right. Uh, okay. Right. Well, what, what now? This is the same. So the expectation of an individual excess hat is just going to be the probability of excess star. Yeah. And what do you mean the probability of excess star? The probability of being one. Yes, exactly. The probability. Uh, no, it'll be the probability. I mean, it'll be the probability of so the actual the, the actual summation to the expectation of excess star. Okay, wait, hold on, hold on. Let's hold on. Sure. So what? So yeah. Yes. So it's it's equal to one okay. times the probability of excess star. No. No. Okay. Because, no, 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 because you have a type error. There's no such thing as the probability of excess star. Excess star is deterministic. Right. There's, there's no probability. It's a variable. It's, a variable. Right. it's not an event. You can only, only events can have probabilities. Excess star is not an event. It's a value. You need to say it differently. Okay. What are you trying to say? So first of all, why do you say one times what? One times, what is the one here for? The one is the realization of excess hat. Okay, so then in an expectation, it's one times the probability that it realizes that value, right? Right. So it's one times the probability that an excess hat is equal to one. That's an event. Okay. Okay. Plus, right? Therefore, yes, agreed. <laughs> so, what we're saying is that in expectation, the number of sets we pick is equal to the value returned by the linear program. Is that a good thing? Or a bad thing? Or a nothing? Or what is it? Or what is, this, is this useful information? Remember our goal of rounding strategies. Take the problem, write it as a digital program, relax the linear program, solve the linear program, Round linear program to integer program. Argue for quality of integer program by looking at quality of linear program. Right? That's been the plan all along. So we've got something here. Is this a good thing or not? We've shown that the expected value of sum of excess hat is equal to LP. What is this quantity here? Forget the expectation. What is this quantity representing? Sum of excess hat. Yes, but, but, but even further back, to the set cover, what is this representing? The number of sets we picked. So we're saying that the number of sets we pick is random, but its average value equals to the LP. But what is the LP value? What is the LP solving? What is this value doing for you? What is it trying to do? This is the LP, right? Here. We're getting an answer to this question, aren't we, with the LP? So what is this telling us? 
What can we say about the LP with respect to the best set cover? We know that the LP is less than or equal to the best. Right? So, we should be very happy now. We have got a solution whose expected value is less than or equal to optimal. You're frowning. You're like, like, what the heck? That was the reaction I said that. <laughs> so this is a very good thing. We have shown that the expected number of sets we pick is very, very good. It's small because it links to the LP. This has been our goal all along to link the integer solution we get to the linear programming solution we get. Okay? And if we take this t times, right, if we do this t times over, then we know that you'll see in a second why I'm repeating t times. But you know, if we repeat it t times, then um, the size is less than or equal to t times LP, which is less than or equal to t times opt. Right? So hey, this means we should just do it once. The fewer times we repeat it, the better we are compared to off. If we do it once, it's great. But what's the catch? There's a catch here. What is the problem with what I just said? So why, why do I even need to repeat more than once? Why don't I just do this once? I've got a very good solution. It's awesome. It's the best solution ever. Why can't I stop? What are the two things you have to worry about when you do wrong? I said there were two things you have to worry about when you take a linear linear program solution and make it an integer program. Sorry? Integrality gap. That's what I seem to be happy with. What we're getting here is pretty good compared to the LP. What's the other thing? Think geometrically. Geometrically speaking, I have this polytope, right? I have this vertex at the end, and I'm rounding it to some grid point. The integrality gap says, oh, I don't want to go too far in. I want to be close. What is the other problem? More words. More words. You're throwing words at me. They're great, but you know, I'm not a, I'm not a word back and grading system. I want actual sentences. What about the constraints? And the polytone. Imagine this it's like thing in your head. I like to think of it like a squashed hexagon. I don't know why I just do. There's a point there. I round it. Where will it go when I round it? You're all assuming when I round it, it always goes inside. It could go outside. We don't know where it's going. What does that mean here in the language of this problem? What is the problem? This may not be feasible. I just picked sets at random, right? And took them. How do I know that I've actually covered the input? Where am I guaranteed that's going to happen? There's no guarantee that the sets I picked was actually covered in input. So do you understand the problem here? If I just do this rounding, suppose those excesses are all very small. There's a very small property of picking any set. Sure, an expectation is great. But if the set values are very small, I may not pick anything at all. I may get an answer of zero. How is that going to be feasible? I have to cover everything. That is why I have to do this over and over again. I do this once, I get some sets. I do this again, I get some more sets. I do this again, I get some more sets. Eventually, I hope to cover it. So the question is, how many times do I have to do it? And the way to answer that question is, what is the probability that I fail to be feasible? That's the event. Fail to be feasible. Fail to be feasible means some point in the universe is not covered. Okay, what is the probability that some point in the universe is not covered? So, what is the probability? Remember, events have probabilities. This is an event. I did some random picking of sets, and a point may or may not have got covered. What is the problem? 
Can we express the property that is didn't get covered in terms of this value? What is the formula for the property that covered? How would I write it down? What is the chance that an element doesn't cover? So what, what, what has to happen for a point for an element of the universe not to be covered in this rounding procedure I just described? What has to go wrong? Well, that, that you can't help anything. If you pick a set that doesn't cover your point, that has nothing to do with your point. Okay. Second? The fraction of a perfect set with the point is there. So think of the process. I have my sets lined up. Okay. The linear program has lined up all my sets and put a little number on them. Point 0.1, point 0.3, point 0.5. Okay, all these numbers on them. Each of those sets contains elements. Or each of those sets sends up a trigger for one of my elements. So all my elements are here, all the sets are there, and the sets are saying, okay, I'm going to be picked. Okay? So let's imagine drawing this out. So we have some element U. Right? And now we can think of all the sets that contain you. Okay? And so this is, you know, S1, S2, up to Sk, and there's X, S1 star, X, S2 star, up to X, Sk star. Okay? I am not picking these sets at random. I'm tossing a coin for each set and deciding whether to pick it or not. If I pick a set, I've covered you. If I don't, I haven't. What is the possibility that you is not covered? How would that event, the event of you not being covered, corresponds to which events? The event that you is not covered means I don't pick any of these sets. I don't pick this, and I don't pick this, and I don't pick this. When you hear an and, what does it mean you just need to do? So you multiply, as long as they're independent. Are these independent events? Yes, every set is chosen independently, right? Okay, what is the probability of the set is not picked? 1 minus x s star, right? You can figure the probability of x s star. So, the probability that u is not covered is equal to 1 minus x s1, then 1 minus x is 2. In general, it's a product over all sets that contain s of 1 minus x s star. Okay? Yes? Now, this is a probability that we want to hope is small. Okay? This is a bad thing. We want the probability of the bad thing to be small. So we want to put an upper bound on this. We want to say this is less than or equal to something. That will make us happy. Okay. Now, we will now use the most important inequality in all of computer science. I'm not exaggerating. This is sort of, there are some cases where this is not true, but for the most part this is true. Um, you can graph this. <laughs> so, so one minus x looks something like this, right? And e to the minus x looks something like this. I'm not writing this right here, but you get the idea. I'm pretty sure I'm not writing this right. Here. But, yeah. So this is true, which means that I can replace this expression. means I can replace it by this expression. Right? Okay. X s star is the solution to the linear program. It 
satisfies all the constraints of the linear program. One of the constraints of the linear program is this. Sigma x is equal, barely equal to 1. You go back down and look now. Because this is the values for the sets that are supposed to cover you. So now, if this number is greater than or equal to 1, then this expression is less than or equal to the minus 1. <coughs> so the probability that a particular element is not covered is equal to the minus 1. If I do this whole process, times independently. The chance that it's not covered in the first step is e to the minus 1. The chance that it eventually gets covered is, you know, the chance that it never gets covered after t trials is, that it is basically the property doesn't get covered in the first time, the property doesn't get covered in the second time, and the third time, and the fourth time, and the fifth time. So the probability that you is not covered after t rounds is less than or equal to e to the minus. Okay. Okay. But I don't want to just avoid not covering one element. I want every element to be so the probability that some element is not covered after t rounds is less than or equal to n times t to the minus t. Why? It's a union bond. Maybe this element was not covered. Maybe that element was not covered. They're all separate events. The bad event that some element is not covered is the or of these events. So you have to add up those probabilities. It gets harder, right? It's one thing to say, okay, the probability of this element not being covered is equal to minus t. But the probability of one of these three, that's a lot higher. The probability of one of these ten, that's a lot higher. So you get that. Now we want that number to be small, right? So we want that probability to be small. So we set t to be roughly n um, um, let's see okay. which is a t to roughly sort of c times log n Okay. Now what's going to happen when this probability is less than or equal to e to the n e to the minus c log n, right? Which is equal to n e to the minus log of n to the c, which is equal to n divided by n to the c, which is equal to 1 over n to the c minus 1. As we've been seeing thus far, um, a 1 over polynomial probability of failure is a good probability of failure. That's a good one. You know, that's what we want. So as what this is saying is that we can't guarantee feasibility. This is actually quite surprising. In our previous rounding step, we guaranteed feasibility. We can't guarantee feasibility here. But if we run this enough times, we can ensure that the probability of being infeasible is really, really small. And by just increasing c, you can make this even smaller. Uh, a constant factor increase in the number of iterations is an exponential improvement in the probability, which is very nice. So that's great. We should just run it for as long as we can just to make sure everything's covered. What's the problem with that? Where is T also? So T is playing this dual role. It's being pulled in two different directions. We pulled in one way to ensure feasibility. But it's also being pulled the other way. Where is it being pulled the other way? We just saw it. It got pulled the other way somehow.
we said we repeat t times and the size is less than t times of 2. The approximation ratio we're getting is t. We want t to be as small as possible. It's like, wait, 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 we're not infeasible, we're infeasible. We need t to be as large as possible. So this pull and push between the two sides is what is getting us to the settling point, which is t is equal to 1. Because you need to make sure that this is a sufficiently small problem to be infeasible. So unlike in the previous cases where feasibility was taken care of deterministically, and you just had to calculate how good the approximation was, here you have a choice. You can be get a better answer but with higher risk of infeasibility, or a slightly worse answer with lower risk of infeasibility. And the point at which this, the risk of infeasibility becomes acceptably small is equal to okay. So the setting, so this gives and O of log n approximation. And notice that this is a lot better than what it could be with our previous approach saying, well, each set occurs, each element occurs in that most f sets. And so, you know, the approximation is n. That could be very big. If there were m sets, it could be as large as n, which could be huge. This is log of n, n is the size of the universe. It's exactly what is small. And it turns out for set cover, you can't do any better. You can prove that. Basically, roughly speaking, unless p is equal to n, uh, unless you know, all the tractable problems are tractable, you cannot get a better approximation of this, this log n. So you kind of get a constant. As n gets bigger, this gets worse. But you still can't do any better. But this is also an example of how choosing a different rounding strategy for the same linear program, in this case a randomized rounding strategy, can actually be better. So a lot of problems, the randomized rounding is basically what I said. Just Take, take the value and toss a coin and then go and replace the value. Then the hard work is showing that impact that feasibility becomes only a component. There are some more details here, right? So you know, I said in expectation you get a good answer, a good approximation. You can you can also say, no, 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 what is the probability that my value is much more is is you know within the right range? In other words, a tailbone on the approximation value. You can show that with a certain probability, if you make the C a bit larger. That with a very high probability, not only will you get log n, you'll be not much more than say two times log n approximation. Then that you can, so then you can you can prove that with high probability all of this happens. Right now, all I've said is that with high probability it's feasible and the expected approximation value is this. But you can convert just like we've seen before, that expected value to the high probability. Okay. Questions? So to recap the final algorithm is Get the linear program values, round it, pick the set. Repeat the C times. If you pick the same set twice, that doesn't matter. You just pick it twice. You don't actually keep two copies of it, you always keep the same. But see, it's, it's simple. Right? You don't have to worry, oh, I'm going to pick this, and I should, should I pick it again? I already picked one. You don't care about this. You just pick it. The analysis doesn't work for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've been TI is T times the cost of So this is good because uh, we have this linear program. It's less than equal to opt. Less than opt and, uh, and in linear program, which we generally have a greater than opt uh, Opt is an integer program. And there will be an integer in fact in general. LP is going to be worse. LP is going to be strictly better than the opt. We're saying that the expectation of solution is as good as the program. Which is really good. But that's only a kind of way. But it can't be actually feasible. So it's like saying, well, if I can cheat and go to the folder, I can do really well. well. Yeah, of course you can. But you have to be inside the folder. In order to be inside the folder, you have to repeat the C times, and now your folder goes to the You see, I mean, so it's almost like at the point of, like, ooh, I've got a good answer here. It's like, yeah, but you're not in the right place. Okay, fine. Don't so forget that again. So now you're worse.
suicide and drugs. Well, not related, but a new dimension. They have a proxy versus close. So we got to this place where we said, idea of optimization and specialization of the program is very powerful because we can express a problem as an individual program, drop the integrality constraint, solve a leader program, which we can do, and um, give a route to get an answer. But I didn't say much about how we solve the leader program, but I also didn't talk about, in some sense, the structure of a linear program. So it turns out that if we're studying a linear program, we're kind of doing it wrong. We're, we're, we're ignoring essentially its identical twin hanging in the shadows, without which you can't fully understand the thing. So this idea of duality says that for every linear program that you build, one goes in a direction, there is sort of an sort of a shadow universe wearing a dark beard of evil, another linear program, right? The dual linear program. And the two are connected in that you can use one to infer things about them. And if you think this idea is strange and doesn't make any sense, then I will just point you back to Maxwell's and Lincoln's. And we said that in order to prove that the max flow algorithm works, we need this idea of a cut and said, oh look, every flow must be less than a cut and therefore we found a cut so the flow can't be any better. That is a simple example of this general principle of linear programming as well. And so what I want to do now is introduce the idea of duality in the language of linear programs and show you how the idea of thinking about how to optimize a linear program leads you to this other linear program, which is dual. And so from the dual's point of view, the first one is the dual. So the dual, you know, primal dual things, which one is primal, which one is dual, it's not, that they just, they exist together. But given one, I will show you what to get now. Okay. So let's take an actual linear program. There's some notes on this, that not in the class, that I'll share with you. And to try to build up an intuition for where this other linear program is going to be. So I'm going to use this example here. So let's say I have this objective I want to maximize. I have four variables. And so I have a linear program that says I want to maximize um, this is a linear objective in four variables. Nice and well. But of course there are constraints. So I'm going to write down some constraints. The first constraint is that we must require okay, um, x2 plus x4 is less than equal to 1. And finally, And uh, we'll assume that all the variables are positive. And just for the sake of, and you'll see why this could be helpful in a second. So this is our goal. We want to optimize for this. And we've already said that, oh, if you draw the constraints, you get this hyperspeed, you get this point open, and you get the little one. That's fine. But if you think of it more algebraically, what would I like to do? What I'd like to do is to say, look, I have all these constraints on my system. Can I somehow use them to put a bound on that? Right? I've solved this program. I get that. So the answer is 5 or something. How do I know that 5 is the correct answer, that I couldn't get 6? The only way I can show this is to say, look, within the constraints we have, there is no way you can get 6 by putting these constraints together. So how would I reason about that? Well, one way to reason about that is say, OK, let me try to combine these constraints in a certain way. Okay. So in particular, let's assume we have a solution. Let's assume we have a candidate solution. Um, the solution is x1 is equal to 1, x2 is equal to half, x3 is equal to 0, and x4 is equal to half. If we do that and we plug it in, we get 1 plus 1 plus half, and we get the LP solution as 2.5. Okay? And now our question is, could we have that value? Okay? So the first thing to realize in general is that, suppose I have one inequality that looks like this. 
and other equality of effectiveness. I can make a new inequality on these two. It looks like this. Right? The A is less than equal to B, and C is less than equal to B, I know that both sides. And in fact, I can do something even better. I could say, you know, um, I could say, I could multiply the first inequality by 2 and the second one by 3. And I could say, 2a plus 3c is less than or equal to 2b plus 3b. You still work. As long as I always multiply by positive numbers. Because if I multiply by negative numbers, the inequality will flip around and then I can't do this anymore. So as long as I can multiply the first inequality by some positive number and the second by some positive number, I can add them and I can get the same thing. So, so let's do this. So that's why I put numbers. So let's do the following. Let's do um, one, so one, input two and three. Um, okay. So let's do this. I'm allowed to do this. These are inequalities and I've got positive numbers. So if you multiply the first one by half, add the second one, and multiply the third one by half, right? What are you going to get? It's going to be hard because I don't have much space here. So we're going to get um, 1 over 2 plus 3. So we're going to get, so x1 shows up half and half. So you're going to get x1. Um, x2 is only showing up as a half. So that's that. Right? Is that correct? What did I get wrong? No, oh, that's x2. Sorry. x2 is here too. So there's two x2s. Okay? Um, x3. x3 shows up as a half in the first uh, and a one in the second. Um, X4 shows up as a 1, and that shows up as a 1. No, is that correct? No, it does not show up as a 1, it shows up as a 2.5. Right? Agree? And now if we look at the objective, the objective was x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 plus x4. What I did here gave me x1 plus 2x2 plus 1.5x3 plus x4. All the variables are positive. Right? I saw the variables positive. Therefore, the objective, so the objective, which was x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 plus x4, is less than or equal to this thing we just wrote out here which is x1 plus 2x2 plus 3 over 2x3 plus x4, which you've just shown is less than 2.5. So we have shown that no matter what we do, as long as we stay feasible, we can never get an answer that's more than 2.5. And we've shown that we've got an answer that's 2.5. So clearly we've got the optimal solution, right? Make sense? We said, look, we, what we said was we've got an answer 2.5. We wonder if we can do better. We said, let's look at the constraints and play with them in some clever way. We played with them in some clever way and realized, oh, wait, because of the constraints, there's no way this expression can be more than 2.5. But this expression strictly dominates the actual thing. And therefore, the actual thing can be no more than 2.5. And therefore, it must be optimal. So, by being very clever in how we chose which numbers to multiply those inequalities by, we magically got something that gave us what we want. But we don't want to magically guess numbers, we want an algorithm to find those numbers. So, if we formulate a strategy to get those numbers that will give us the best upper bound we can get, the smallest value we can achieve. 
how would we do that? What we're really saying is that we want to find variables to multiply each of the inequalities above. Right? So if we write down our expression here, so we write down our general LP form, maximize C transpose X, given that AX is less than equal to B, and AX is less than equal to zero. This AX less than B is a bunch of constraints, one for each row, right? And I want to associate variables with each of those constraints to multiply those things by. Right? So if I think of a bunch of variables, so I expand this out. So I have you know, this matrix A here times X is less than or equal to B. I want to multiply each row by a number. And one way to think about that is that um, I put a little Y here. Y transpose, which multiplies this by eight. Not as an equality, but I'm going to multiply that by that. Okay? Um, and I'm going to add them up. So if you think of this as this is the first row, this is the second row, and so on. Right? Um, I want to multiply. Mm, So let me write this up. So, so we have any particular inequality, which is like a11 x1 plus a12 a12 x2 plus a1 n xn is less than equal to b1. I want to find a variable y y1, which I will then multiply by this. Okay, as my scaling factor for that constraint. Right? And um, if we do that. We know that y1 times the first expression plus y2 times the second one will be less than equal to y1 d1 plus y2 d2 plus y n d n, right? Because I'm just multiplying y on both sides. Just like we did before. Okay. Um, all right. And so we have now shown that if we chose the y's carefully, we can upper bound this expression by this. Okay? But what we want to do is match the coefficient. So if we look at one of these expressions, so if we look at you know y transpose a times x, right? You can think of it as y transpose a times x. Right? And what we want is that the coefficients we get for x should be greater than or equal to c transpose x. Why? Because we want, when we write down all those coefficients, we want those numbers to dominate what my thing is going to be. Because now when you say this is less than or equal to that, that's going to be less than or equal to that. Right? So we want to make sure that we choose the y's so that y transpose a is greater than or equal to c transpose. And we want to find, choose y, so we minimize y transpose b. So if you now look at this, and look at this, we now have a new object. that came from so in the course of searching for a best way to upper bound that linear program there the search for that best upper bound turns out to be a new linear program that if we search for the best y values, the answer we get will be the best upper bound on that. So the smallest value we can get for the upper bound limits the best upper bound we can get for that. Think min, cut, max, flow. And this secondary LP, the dual, can be written syntactically directly from this. And what we've just shown is that for any linear program, 
not for less, that's the for Y. And it lowers less than This is what we just talked about. If we choose Y to satisfy those constraints, then this will always be wrong. And the miraculous thing we will see next time is that for linear programs that are bounded, they don't have this big opening in them, and that they're feasible, they actually have something in them, these two are equal. The solution to the dual linear program is exactly the same as the solution to the primal linear program. Moreover, by looking at them both in tandem, you can actually figure out how to, how to find a simple integer solution.